tonight? Well, guess what? Schofield does not agree with you. Let's let me let's go back to verse number one and look what the Bible has to say. The Bible says in verse number one, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. In verse number two, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now stop right there. According to Schofield, what Schofield teaches right here in verse number two is he teaches what is called the gap theory. Now let me just read to you his notes about this so that you can see, uh, so that you can hear his own words because his own words condemn him. Now Schofield says in his notes right here on page three of your Schofield reference Bible, he says this, he says, typically it, referring to Genesis chapter number one, typically it speaks of the new birth and the new creation where all was chaos and ruin. Now, what did he just say? He just said that everything that you see there in Genesis chapter number one and verse number one and verse number two is that it is speaking of everything that was just chaos and ruin. Now, did we just read about chaos and ruin? I thought the Bible said that God saw that everything was what? Was good, was very good, the Bible says. There is no chaos in this chapter. I mean, all throughout this chapter, it is very orderly, isn't it? It gives you the first day, the second day, everything that was made on those days, everything given in order. There is no chaos. But yet he says that the new creation where all was chaos and ruin. <coughs> now he says this in his notes. Let me go ahead and show you what he's referring to there. In his notes, he says this down at the bottom of page three in his notes there. He says, the first creative act refers to the dateless past and gives scope for all geologic ages. Now, what is he saying there? You see, what he is trying to do is he's trying to come up with a theory where, where he makes the Bible bring in evolution and teach evolution. So here's what Schofield teaches. Schofield teaches what is called the gap theory. And in that theory, in verse number two, <coughs> where it says that the earth was without form and void, is he says that this was, the, was where everything was in chaos and ruin, and that in ages past, before what we're reading right here, that before God created the heaven and the earth, that there was another heaven, and another earth that God had created, and a whole nother society where fallen angels had come down and where they had tempted man and caused man to go into sin. And then because of that sin, God eventually judged that society and destroyed that society. And everything was destroyed. So everything of the earth at that point was void and without form. So that's what he's teaching there. He's teaching the gap theory, and he teaches that this could include millions of years. Because what does he say there? He says there, <coughs> the first creative act refers to the dateless past and gives scope for all geologic ages. You see, he's trying to say that it accounts for all the geologic ages that we can see on the face of the earth now. That the face of the earth now bears the marks of all the chaos and the ruin that had happened before God had even created this earth. Now let's just see if this lines up with scripture. In fact, we're going to look at the same scriptures that he gives as proof for this. Because he gives some other scriptures and says, this is what these scriptures refer to. And by the way, this is why you can't trust your reference Bibles. Even if you just have a Bible that only that doesn't have notes and only has references in the center column, remember those references were given to you by man. And just because man says that this reference applies to Genesis chapter number one does not mean that it does. 
Everybody understand that here tonight? Because here's what Schofield says. Schofield, uh, the first scripture he cites is Jeremiah chapter number 4, verses 23 through 26. So remember, he says here, you know, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the earth, that that <clears throat> was the earth in chaos and ruin. The, it was the evidence of another society that had come in the past. And so he says, Jeremiah is proof of that. Now let's go to Jeremiah, and let's just see if that holds water. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 4, and look at verse number 23. Jeremiah chapter number 4, verse number 23. Go ahead and turn over there. Jeremiah chapter number 4 and verse number 23. Remember, what have I told you many times? When you're disproving false doctrine, what is the first thing that you should do? Go to the reference that they cite and get the context of what it's talking about because oftentimes you can completely destroy their false doctrine with the same verses that they use to try to prop up their false doctrine. Because what are they doing? They're not to using the word honestly and truthfully. They're using it and they're taking the scriptures and twisting it out of context, which is exactly what Schofield does here. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 4. And let's look down <clears throat> at verse number 23. And first we'll read the passages, the verses that he gives. And then we're going to look back at the entire chapter and look at a lot of verses here. Jeremiah chapter number 4 and verse number 23. The Bible says, And I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. And I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. And I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. Now, if all you read, if all you ever if all you ever heard was Schofield and his explanation, and the only thing you read was that one short excerpt, you might could be deceived into that, couldn't you? I mean, there's some similar wording there that's being used. And so you can see how somebody could be deceived. But remember, we want to look at the entire passage. We want to look at the context of the passage and see what the passage is talking about, right? And we want to see who it is talking to in this portion of Scripture. Excuse me, my voice cracked there like a, well, like John Mark sometimes, right? Anyways, look back at what the Bible says right there. Uh, Jeremiah chapter number 4, look back at verse number 1. I just had to take the shot on you, John Mark. John, uh, Jeremiah chapter number 4, and look down at verse number 1. And see what the Bible has to say there. Jeremiah chapter number 4. In verse number 1 the Bible says. If thou wilt return. O what? Israel. Israel with, saith the Lord. Return unto me. And if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight. Then shalt thou not remove. So who are we talking to? We're talking to Israel aren't we? Now forgive me if I'm wrong. But before Genesis chapter number 1, did Israel exist? No, they did not exist. And so the whole context and what we will see all throughout this chapter is God says over and over and over and over again, Israel, 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 Judah, 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 over and over and over again. It's almost like God knew that somebody named C.I. Schofield would come along and take advantage and take the scripture out of context so he makes it impossible for you to do so unless you're a heretic, unless you're a deceiver. Because look at what the Bible says here, verse number 2. And the Bible says this, and it says... And thou shalt swear the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness, and the nation shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. Verse number 3. For thus saith the Lord to who? To the men of Judah and who? And Jerusalem. Hey, before Genesis chapter number 1, the nation of Judah did not exist. And the, and the city of Jerusalem did not exist. So how in the world do you take this and twist it out of context and say that this comes before Genesis chapter number 1? Look back down at what the Bible says. Let's prove it further. It just gets even easier from here on out. Verse number 5, the Bible says, Declare ye in where? 
in Judah and publish in where? In Jerusalem, the Bible says, go on down to verse number 10. And the Bible says in verse number 10, Then said I, our Lord God, surely thou hast greatly deceived this people. What people? And where? And Jerusalem, saying, Ye shall have peace, where is the sword reacheth unto the soul. Now look at verse number 11. And at that time shall it be said to this people, and to who? Jerusalem, a dry wind uh, of the high places in the wilderness toward who? The daughter of my people. Now that's important. It applies to the end of the chapter. Let's go on down and look at some more verses. Go down to verse number 14. And the Bible says, O oh, who? Jerusalem, was thine heart from wickedness that thou mayest be saved? How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? And let's go on now. Verse number 15. For a voice declareth from who? Dan and publisheth affliction from where? Mount Ephraim. Who are Dan and Mount Ephraim? Two of the tribes of the nation of Israel, right? So anybody have any doubt who we're talking to right here? And what time period we're talking about? I mean, if we're talking about Dan, we're talking about Mount Ephraim, and we're talking about Jerusalem, and we're talking about Judah, and we're talking about Israel, are we pre-Genesis chapter number 1 or way after that? Way after that. Look back at what the Bible has to say. Let's look at some more scriptures. Go to verse number 16. The Bible says right there in verse number 16, Make ye mention to the nations, Behold, publish against who? Jerusalem, that watchers come from a far country and give out their voices against the cities of who? Of Judah. You see who we're talking to tonight? Anybody have any doubts so far? I mean, was that I mean was that not clear enough for you? I mean, do I need to say it a few more times for you? I mean, does God need to say it more times? You see what I mean? That he says over and over and over and over again throughout this chapter who he is speaking to. That he's speaking to Dan, that he's speaking to Mount Ephraim, that he's speaking to Israel, that he's speaking to Judah, that he's speaking to this people, the daughter of my people, to Jerusalem, he says. So this is not pre-Genesis chapter number 1, is it? In fact, look back at the scripture there. Let's just look at a few more, shall we? Verse number 22, the Bible says in verse number 22, <laughs> and it says, for my, and by the way, this is one verse before the passage he uses. Look at what it says, for my what? People is foolish, they have not known me, they are sottish children, they have none understanding, they are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. Go down to verse number 29, and the Bible says right there, the whole city shall flee from the noise of the horsemen and from the and bowmen. They shall go into thickets and climb up upon the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man dwell therein. What cities are we talking about? The cities uh, in Judah, Jerusalem being one of those, right? Look down at verse number 31. And the Bible says, For I have heard a voice as of a woman in travail, and the anguish as, her, as of her that bringeth forth her, her first child, the voice of the daughter of who? Zion, that bewaileth herself, that spreadeth her hand, saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is wearied because of murderers. So all throughout this chapter, it's talking about Jerusalem, Judah, the cities of Judah, Israel, Dan, Ephraim, that they are going to have the wrath of God. That because they've gone and worshipped other gods, that God is going to bring judgment upon them. And that's why it says, woe unto me. That there's judgment coming upon them. And that's why it says back in verse number 23, that the earth was without form and void. You know what it's saying? That because of warfare that the earth was without form and void, that everything had been destroyed, that the plants had been destroyed, that the birds had fled, that the animals had fled, that the men had fled. Why? Because of warfare. You don't think that's true? Well, go, why don't you take a trip tonight and go over to a war-torn a war nation tonight? I mean, there's many of them in the, in the world, aren't there? 
I mean, if you go over to those lands, you can see exactly what Jeremiah was talking about. Because if you go into those lands, guess what? You're, you're going to see the earth without form and void. That everything's destroyed. That you and that and that main. A lot of times you can't see the sky. Why does it say that he couldn't see the stars? Because what happens in battle? Smoke, right? I mean, things get set on fire, and there's smoke that fills the skies. In fact, the Bible says that. Look back at what the Bible has to say, verse number 28. And the Bible says, For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee for the noise of the horsemen and bowmen. They shall go, uh, go into the thickets and climb up upon the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man dwell therein. So what is it that is causing them to flee? Is it just God raining supernatural fire and brimstone from the sky at this point? Is he just destroying the face of the entire earth? Or is this upon Judah? It's upon Judah. One geographical region of the earth. Not the entire earth, right? Because he didn't say the entire earth, did he? He emphasized it over and over and over again that this was to Judah, that this was to Jerusalem, the cities of Judah, Dan, Ephraim, Israel. One geographic region is who this is to, not the entire.